Who's in just one such reaction? This is how a single Swedish submarine defeated the U.S. Navy. But some real engineering. What? What the? What the fuck? Why is Federation not covering things like this, man? How did metric system whoop your ass? Yeah. How did one Swedish submarine defeat the entire U.S. Navy? This is like the Iran thing, but opposite. But instead, of U.S. you know U.S. kicking you know Iran's ass in here like one submarine, Swedish submarine, Swedish submarine uh, defeated the entire U.S. Navy. Yeah, the, the sentence doesn't make sense, but yeah, it's going to be interesting. This was a real engineering apparently. Uh, it's a short video, so I guess it's not much about it. It's just like something something happened. And that's it. <laughs> All right. Remember, if you like, like, comment, subscribe. Don't forget to like, 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 subscribe. This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. The United States military has the strongest and most diverse navy in the world. The U.S. military's fleet of aircraft carriers is so large it makes the U.S. Navy the second largest air force in the world, second only to the actual U.S. Air Force. <laughs> a single Nimitz-class aircraft carrier like the USS Ronald Reagan, a 6.2 billion dollar nuclear-powered ship, can carry twice the aircraft as any other foreign carrier, which makes it even more shocking that it was sunk by a single diesel-powered Swedish submarine during war games in 2005. A single submarine that cost the same as a single F-35 at a hundred million dollars managed to sneak by an entire carrier task force with anti-submarine defenses to enter the red zone and score multiple torpedo hits on the U.S. Ronald Reagan, sinking it virtually before shrinking back into the vast ocean undetected. This was just one of many exercises where the Swedish Gotland-class submarine proved too stealthy for the world's strongest navy. The new submarine proved so threatening that the U.S. military leased the Swedish sub for an additional year to develop strategies to counter the silent threat. So, what set the Gotland apart from other subs? The submarine's primary instrument to detect enemy subs is sonar. Sonar is essentially a finely tuned ear that works like a whale's or dolphin's echolocation to create a 3D map of the ocean around it. There is active sonar where the submarine will send out a sound pulse called a ping and listen for the reflections. But in warfare, this isn't a sound strategy, as the ping is detected by enemies to give your exact location. So passive sonar is used where no ping is emitted, and instead you simply listen. These electronic ears are so accurate that the nationality of submarines can be determined based on the operating frequency of the alternating current used in its power systems. The 60 hertz alternating current of a U.S. sub could be differentiated from the 50 hertz of European subs if the transformers and other electronics were not adequately insulated from the hull. The Swedes managed to create a submarine so silent that it was practically undetectable by passive sonar. So how did they do this at such a low cost? The Gotland was the first submarine in the world to use a Stirling engine as its power generator. Stirling engines are not a new concept, with the first being created and patented by Robert Stirling in 1816. Inspired by a series of high-pressure steam boiler explosions at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, Stirling wanted to create a safer engine that did not require such high pressures. I can't be arsed trying to animate this old drawing, so let's go for something simpler. He did this by creating a closed cylinder containing a fixed mass of gas permanently sealed within. Here, one side of the piston cylinder has a large buffer space, which allows for a relatively constant pressure on this side of the piston, while the other side fluctuates in pressure due to alternating heating cycles. When heat is applied to the outside of the cylinder, the pressure increases, causing the piston to move until the pressure equalizes. Okay. Now, if we cool the outside of the cylinder with a heat exchanger, the pressure will drop, and once again, the piston will move. This is our basic pressure cycle to create mechanical work. But this is an insanely inefficient system, as most of the energy we put into the system as heat is lost during the cooling cycle. Not yeah, to the I gas, mean, but the actual cylinder wall. Which I mean, if you're if you're transferring energy through cold and Heat, basically, right? Yeah, it's inefficient as fuck. That's the whole. Th uh, that's the whole point, right? Heat is the one of the most in inefficient way of doing things. Heat is just energy. It's like basically having no medium to transfer energy. So if you're using heat, as in like, if you're transferring energy through like that, obviously it's going to be inefficient. But I guess it's going to be silent. Is that what it is? Which provides no mechanical work. Robert Stirling solved this by adding a displacer piston, which can drive the gas from one end of the cylinder to the other, allowing this end to be permanently hot and the other to be permanently cold. 
so the cylinder wall is no longer experiencing a temperature cycle. The pressure cycle here works slightly differently. First, the air on the hot end expands and causes the displacer to move into contact with the power piston, displacing more air from the cold end to be heated and expanded, allowing work to be done on the power piston. The air on the hot end now has nowhere to go and so is driven to the cold end, where it is cooled and contracts causing work to be done once again on the power piston. This is our new pressure cycle. The efficiency of this system can be increased further by placing what is essentially a heat battery in the tubes between the hot and cold cylinders. This conserves a huge amount of heat that would otherwise be wasted during the cooling cycle and gives the heat back to the air as it travels back through. Robert Sterling dubbed this the regenerator. Now we have the foundations of a useful engine. By incorporating a coolant system and a heating chamber, we create a larger temperature differential to drive the engine, and the efficiency can be further increased by increasing the number of tubes connecting the hot and cold spaces, along with the number of regenerators, and adding fins to increase the surface area of okay. these tubes to allow for heat transfer. Did I say simplified? Sorry. We're just about to be finished, man. We're still at the engine. I meant easier to read. Maybe I like the misery. Sterling engines ultimately fell into obscurity as stronger steel became available to make steam engine boilers safer. But I've seen a resurgence in recent decades with the Gotland being the most famous implementation. The Gotland uses two Sterling engines that use diesel and liquid oxygen to provide heat, which in turn runs at 75 kilowatt generators. These generators can run an electric motor directly or charge batteries that can provide a huge boost in speed when needed. All the while the exhaust is compressed and stored on board, allowing the sub to stay submerged for up to two weeks, vastly longer than any other diesel powered submarine. So why is it so silent compared to other submarines? It doesn't require much explanation as to why an internal combustion engine using tiny controlled explosions for power tends to lead to some noise. Mm. While the multi-billion dollar nuclear powered submarines need to pump huge volumes of coolant to their reactors to prevent a meltdown, causing enough noise to be detectable by passive sonar within a certain range. On top of this, recently declassified intelligence suggests that Russian submarines are using these instruments to detect the faint trail of radiation left in the wake of these nuclear-powered submarines, giving the Swedish submarine another way of avoiding detection. This is a fascinating... Oh my god, I, what the fuck? Man, these Swedes are just like insane. They just basically use like old-style heat and cold transfer engine to make sure that there is no bangs. Right, there's no first. It's not nuclear power, so there's no nuclear radiation. So detection is insanely low, so you can just sneak past it. In the in the era of modern technology, people are trying to detect shit. You know, basically modern wise, like oh, it must be like some kind of a modern engine, modern uh, reactor, or whatever. No, no, no. It's like very old style heat and cold transfer engine. So yeah, yeah. Everybody basically walking around with guns, right? Nobody's thinking of sword. That's what this is application of the laws of thermodynamics. Understanding and applying the laws of science is the closest to a real life superpower in this world. So why not unlock your superpower of understanding the universe by taking oh, this course it? on astronomy on brilliant. Man, this video felt like very small though. Come on, there has to be more. Ah, come on, man. This felt very small video. All right. <laughs> okay, so I guess it's just like, that's it. It just like went silently and just like virtually sent it, I guess. This wall of virtual exercise. Virtual means like, okay, they won't, it's like, it's an exercise, right? It's a difference between virtual and real life scenarios. Real life scenarios might be different because real things are at stake. Where yeah, this is just like, what the fuck? The title panicked me. Like, what the fuck? How is like one Swedish submarine did this to US Navy? But yeah, it's a virtual thing. And obviously like US took this way too seriously and just like trying to, you know, find a way, like least the submarine trying to find a way to, you know, mitigate the issue or whatever. Yeah. Horrible, that was how a single student submarine defeated the US Navy by real, real engineering. If you like my next one, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.